Hi everyone, it's Mrs V here and today we are going to learn about acids and bases. Now you may think that you've learned about acids and bases in the past but let me tell you there is a great deal more to the acid base story than you've learned at this stage. So let's get on, let's expand our experience of acids and bases. Now in the past you have probably studied acids and bases and you've probably learned things like there is a pH scale that we use to measure whether something's acidic or basic. You may have learned some of the properties of acids and bases. You may know that acids have a sour taste. You may know that they turn the indicator litmus red. And you may have even studied their reaction with metals to produce hydrogen gas. And you may have studied their reaction with carbonates to produce carbon dioxide gas. As far as bases go, you've probably learned that they have a bitter taste. You've probably tested them with litmus and seen that they turn red litmus blue. And you may even know that they're slippery to the touch. You might have even learned some common examples of acids and bases. For instance, you might remember that citrus fruits contain the acid citric acid. So let's learn a little more today. We're going to start with some definitions. Now, acids and bases have been known for a long time. And it wasn't until the late 1800s, though, that people really started to experiment think about them and propose some sort of explanation for their behavior. Now, the first guy to publish on this was Svante Arrhenius. He was a Swedish chemist. He was a child prodigy. By age three, he taught himself to read and he was also solving some simple maths problems at age three. So he was definitely showing that there were great things to come in his life. So he actually won the 1903 Nobel Prize for his theory of electrolyte dissociation. So his research was mainly about the conductivity of electrolytes. He worked out that um, ionic substances separated into ions when they dissolved in water. So something like sodium chloride, he said existed entirely as sodium ions and chloride ions when you put it in water. He also worked out that some things did not entirely break up into ions. For instance, acetic acid, he said, existed as a mix mixture of acetic acid molecules, acetate ions and hydrogen ions. Uh, he didn't limit himself to the study of electrolytes. He was very interested in all aspects of science. In fact, in 1896, he proposed the earliest climate model of the influence of atmospheric carbon dioxide in producing the greenhouse effect. And he was actually the first scientist to discuss the effect of industrial activity on global warming. So he was really a man ahead of his time. In 1903, not satisfied with simply winning a Nobel Prize in 1903, he also published a textbook on cosmic physics. He was very interested in the Northern Lights and the solar corona. Um, he also performed extensive research on bacterial toxins and plant and animal poisons. So he really did cover all aspects of science. Now, as far as acids and bases go, his definition is that an acid is a substance that contains hydrogen and also ionizes to produce hydrogen ions in aqueous solution. So he basically said that acids produce hydrogen ions when you put them in water. He said a base is a substance that contains a hydroxide group and dissociates to produce hydroxide ions in aqueous solution. So bases dissolve in water and release their hydroxide ions. So that was his idea on acids and bases. Now, this worked pretty well for acids, but unfortunately, it doesn't work very well for bases because there are some bases that don't actually contain hydroxide ions. Things like ammonia or the carbonate ion. They don't contain hydroxide ions, but they're still able to produce hydroxide ions when you put them in water. So his theory of dissociation of electrolytes didn't really explain that. However, 
along came Bronsted and Lowry. So in 1923, Bronsted and Lowry, they're both credited with this. They came up with the idea at exactly the same time and totally independently. They didn't work together at all, but they both came up with this idea. And so they're both credited with the bronsted lowry theory. And this is the theory we're really going to focus on as far as the definition of acids and bases go. So Johannes Nikolaus Bronsted, he was a Danish chemist. He was nominated four times for a Nobel Prize. Unfortunately, no prize. Um, he was a fellow of the Royal Society. The Royal Society is a group of very prominent scientists. You have to be pretty special to get yourself a membership of the Royal Society. Um, Thomas Martin Lowry, he was an English chemist, and he was also a fellow of the Royal Society. No Nobel Prize nominations, though. Anyhow, their theory says that an acid is a substance that donates a proton and a base is a substance that accepts a proton in a chemical reaction. And by proton here, we mean the hydrogen ion. And so they came up with the idea that acid-base reactions are actually proton transfer reactions. There is another theory called the Lewis theory, which was also published in 1923. And this is Gilbert Lewis um, of our covalent bonding fame. Now, if you want to know more about Gilbert Lewis, then you need to check out my video on electronegativity and Lewis dot diagrams, where I give a bit of a bio. Had a very, very interesting life. Okay, he was an American chemist. Um, he had 41 Nobel Prize nominations, but no prize. Check out that other video for some theories why. So because he was into covalent bonding, he was very into electrons. And he suggested another way of looking at acid-base reactions in terms of electrons. So in the Lewis theory, bases donate pairs of electrons and acids accept pairs of electrons. So therefore a hydrogen ion as a Lewis acid can accept a pair of electrons because of its positive charge. And a Lewis base like the hydroxide ion can donate because of its negative charge. So, Lewis theory is really more applicable to redox reactions. What we're going to focus on is the bronsted lowry definition. So let's look at this idea that acids are proton donors and bases are proton acceptors. First of all, what we mean by a proton is a hydrogen ion. And the reason we call that a proton is if you look at the hydrogen atom, we have one proton, and one electron. And of course, if that becomes an ion by losing its electron, then what is left is just the proton. So whenever we talk about proton donors, proton acceptors, we're actually talking about hydrogen ions there. Now, when acids are placed in water, the acid donates a proton to the water molecule. All acids contain hydrogen. And we have this hydrogen ion being attracted to a water molecule because the non-bonding electron pairs on the oxygen atom are a center of negative charge and the hydrogen ion is positive. So we actually get attraction of opposite charges here. And that attraction is actually enough to suck that hydrogen onto the molecule. And it is held on so strongly, it actually forms a covalent bond. But the difference to a normal covalent bond is that the hydrogen came along without any electrons. And the oxygen therefore donated both electrons to the shared pair. So this shared pair here, both electrons come from the oxygen. And this forms what we call a coordinate covalent bond. This is also known as a dative bond. You can't actually tell which of the three covalent bonds here 
is the dative bond, so it has no difference at all in properties to a normal covalent bond. And as you can see here, the oxygen still has its octet. This hydrogen has a duet. This hydrogen has a duet and this hydrogen has a duet. So all of the valence shell requirements have been met. However, if you count up all the protons and all the electrons in that molecule, you will find that there are more protons than electrons. That's because we started with the neutral molecule water and the hydrogen came onto that molecule without contributing an electron. So it contributed a proton, but not an electron. So what we have now is that this molecule that's been formed, which is called a hydronium ion, has a positive charge. And that positive charge is not centered on the oxygen atom or any of the hydrogen atoms. It's actually spread across the entire molecule. And this is why we write the molecule, the hydronium ion, which is H3O plus, we write that in brackets and we put the plus on the outside of the bracket to show that it is everything inside the bracket that's actually experience is actually having that positive charge. So let's have a look a little bit more closely about how this donation of hydrogen occurs. So we've got an acid here, we've got HCl. So this is your hydrogen and this is your chlorine. And we're looking at that hydrogen on the HCl being attracted to the water molecule and eventually leaving the, H, leaving the chlorine and bonding with the water molecule. Now, why would something like that occur? Let's have a look. So hydrogen chloride, HCl and water, are what we call polar molecules. Now, what that means is that they have little negative and positive charges on them. Chlorine is much better. If we look at HCl, let's look at the chlorine here, bonded to the hydrogen. Now, if we look at the Lewis dot structure for that, there's Lewis again, he's back with us. Then we know that chlorine came into this bonding situation with seven electrons, because it's in group seven, and it's sharing an electron with hydrogen that came in with one electron. We're representing hydrogen's electron with a cross. Now, you might think that that electron pair would sit pretty well halfway between the hydrogen and the chlorine. But because the chlorine is so much better at attracting electrons than the hydrogen, we find that that electron pair actually sits really close to the chlorine. So here's chlorine's electron and hydrogen. Sorry, I think I drew them the other way around last time. And what that means is that chlorine sort of partly gained that electron and hydrogen's partly lost it. And that actually brings about some little charges. So the chlorine is slightly negatively charged and the hydrogen is slightly positively charged. And we use that lowercase delta. So this is a delta, Greek letter delta. It's the lowercase delta. And that represents a very small charge. Now the same occurs in water. If we have a look at the water molecule, then we know that water has a couple of non-bonding pairs on the oxygen. And then we have the covalent bond here with the hydrogen. However, because oxygen is much better at attracting electrons to water than hydrogen, then we end up with those electron pairs sitting a little bit closer to the oxygen than they are to the hydrogen, which brings about a little negative charge on the oxygen and a little positive charge on each of the hydrogens. 
Now, what happens when those molecules collide is that you actually have that hydrogen in the middle. You have your hydrogen, you've got your oxygen with your, in your water molecule, and you've got your chlorine. And <clears throat> when they're together, the oxygen's actually a little bit more negative than the chlorine is. And so when they collide, what actually happens is the hydrogen here is being attracted to both the oxygen and the chlorine. So the hydrogen's got some attraction this way and some attraction that way, but the oxygen's a little bit more negative. So it's a little bit more delta minus than chlorine. So it actually pulls more strongly on the hydrogen and therefore the hydrogen goes off with the water molecule and leaves the chlorine by itself. Now, when this happens, we produce a hydronium ion, which we know is an electron deficient molecule. It's got more protons than electrons, but because the hydrogen left without its electron, chlorine kept hydrogen's electron, this actually now has an excess of electrons. And so that actually has a negative charge now. So we see that HCl has been the acid because it is donating the proton and water is being the base because it's accepting the proton. Have a look at another example. Let's have a look at the example of ammonia <clears throat> acting as a base. So, what we see here is in the reaction between ammonia and water that the hydrogen on the water molecule is being donated, it's being attracted to the lone pair on the nitrogen atom, and it's being donated. And this makes what's called the ammonium ion. So NH4 plus, this is similar, similar to, to hydronium. So this time the nitrogen has provided both of the electrons to the shared pair. We still have an octet for nitrogen, a duet for all of the hydrogens. So valence shell requirements are met. However, the hydrogen has come without its electron and therefore we've got more protons than electrons. So this is electron deficient. And therefore we see a positive charge on the ammonium ion. And this is spread across the entire molecule. So we have it in square brackets. Now, because hydrogen left without its electrons, the oxygen in the hydroxide ion still has an octet. This hydrogen has a duet, therefore all valence fuel requirements have been met. However, the oxygen has kept the electron that used to belong to hydrogen. So this is now has an excess of electrons. And that's why we see this negative charge. You might notice, hang on, water was an acid last time, it was an acid, sorry, this time, and it was a base last time. So what is this? What is going on with this water molecule? It seems to be accepting, donating. It doesn't know what it is. The term we have for substances that can donate or accept electrons is amphiprotic. Water is not the only one, and we're going to learn more about them in future videos. All right, what we're going to do now is a worked example. I want you to pause the video. And I want you to work out in this particular example, which is the bronsted lowry acid and which is the bronsted lowry base. And I just want you to do this for the reactants. All right, how did you go? Let's have a look. So for doing this, I think the most useful thing is to work out which species are actually related. Now I can see that this species and this species are related because they're the only ones that contain nitrogen. And therefore, I'm going to look at what's happened. 
So what I can see over here is that we have you know, a hydrogen on the NO3. And over here, we don't have the hydrogen. So that means this hydrogen has actually been lost. So where did the hydrogen go? Well, if we look at the other reactants, we see water here and the hydronium ion. And we see that this has one extra hydrogen than it had before. So what's actually happened in this reaction is that this hydrogen has actually gone onto the water molecule. So that means that the HNO3, the nitric acid, is donating its proton. And that, of course, means it's a bronsted lowry acid. Water is accepting the proton. And that means it's a bronsted lowry base. Let's have a go at the next one. So first of all, let's work out which species are related. I can see two that contain fluorine. That's how I know they're related. And I can see the other two are simply made of hydrogen and oxygen. So what am I seeing happen here? I am seeing that the hydrogen fluoride turned into the fluoride ion, so it's lost its hydrogen. So this hydrogen is going onto the water molecule. And therefore, this is our acid because it's donating its proton and this is our base. All right, now it's time to talk about the difference between ionization and dissociation. Now, these terms are often incorrectly used interchangeably, but they have different meanings. So what we have is that ionization is a chemical reaction which produces ion and ions, and that's normally from neutral molecules. Whereas dissociation is a process where a substance breaks up into ions. So the key difference, I guess, is that for ionization, the ion, you start with the neutral molecule. Sometimes you start with an ion and a neutral molecule. And here, the ions are already present. All right, let's look at ionization. So we have acids ionize in water. Okay, this is why we're looking at ionization because acids always ionize. So if we look at hydrochloric acid reacting with water, then we see that the hydrogen is being donated here to the water. And this is making our hydronium ion here, H3O plus. And our chloride ion, Cl minus. So what we can see here is that we've started with a neutral molecule. There's no charge here and there's no charge here. But what we've ended up with is ions. So you can see we've ended up with charged species. So this is ionization because we are producing ions from neutral, the reaction of neutral molecules. Another example is ammonia reacting with water. These are the two examples we looked at earlier. You can see we've started here neutral, no charge, neutral, no charge. And the products have charges, so we've created ions. Dissociation is simply the process where an ionic substance breaks up into its ions. Now, some bases dissociate, but some ionize. Particularly the metal hydroxides, pretty good at dissociating, but some ionize. So we saw the example previously of ammonia ionizing in water, but you can definitely say all acids ionize in water. So they all have neutral molecules reacting to form ions, whereas some bases dissociate, but some ionize. 
get those definitions straight. Okay, conjugate acid base pairs. When an acid ionizes, when it donates its proton, the thing that you actually produce is called its conjugate base. So here we can see hydrogen fluoride. And when it donates its proton, you get the fluoride ion. So they are connected by either the loss or the gain of a hydrogen ion. Only one. So conjugate acid base pairs differ by H. Plus. So if the HF loses its hydrogen ion, then you get the conjugate base. And if the fluoride ion gains hydrogen, you get its conjugate acid. So a conjugate acid base pair difference of H. Plus. The other con, there are always two conjugate acid base pairs in a reaction. Water here is acting as the base. So here's water and its conjugate acid is the hydronium ion. So when water gains H plus, you get the hydronium ion. And when the hydronium ion loses H plus, you get the water molecule. So you've got your, your conjugate acid and your conjugate base. So you take away H plus from the acid and you get the conjugate base and you add H plus to the base and you get the conjugate acid. Let's have a go at some examples. So I'm going to go through a couple. I'm going to go through the first acid and the first base and then I'm going to get you to have a go. So for each of these I want you to fill in the table. So if you've got an acid and you want to find the conjugate base, you have to take away H plus. So if you take away H plus, then what happens is that the conjugate base will go down by one hydrogen, so it'll just be Cl, and it'll go down by one charge because you're losing a positive. With the base going to the conjugate acid, you've got to add H plus. So the species goes up by a hydrogen. So instead of NH3, it'll be NH4 now. And it'll be going up by a positive charge. All right, pause the video and have a go at the others. And we are going to come back with the answers for you to check. OK. Let's do the acid table first. If the conjugate base is Br minus, to get back to the acid, we're going to need to add its H plus back. So it's going to go up by an H and up by a charge. So it was charge negative one, now it's charge zero. Okay, acetic acid, this is the acid in vinegar. Now, this is an interesting molecule because it has four hydrogens, but only one of them is acidic. And the reason for this is if we look at the actual structure of acetic acid, and you're going to learn more about this in other videos. If you're interested, I do have a video on carboxylic acids. All right. Hang on, where is my rubber? Draw that bond out. Now, remember we talked before about the delta minus delta plus, the partial charges. That is what actually allows this hydrogen to be lost because the carbon to hydrogen bond is not polar at all. So these bonds are non-polar. Carbon and hydrogen are pretty equal in their ability to grab electrons. So that bond is not polar. So there's no chance of that being that hydrogen here being attracted to something else because it's actually held still pretty strongly. However, this one is able to be donated. So let's have a look at what we get. 
So we're going to still have our CH3 and our COO, but we're not going to have the H anymore. It goes down by an H and down by a charge. OH minus, we've got to go up by H plus. So we're going to have two hydrogens, one oxygen, and the charge will now be zero. HPO42 minus, we're going to take away its H plus. So it's going to be, it's going to lose the H, it's going to be PO4. And instead of two minus now, it's going to be three minus. HSO4 minus, if we put its H plus back, then we're going to get H2SO4. Over on the base side, we have CH3 and H3 plus. To go back to the base form, we're going to have to lose H plus. So we're going to have, oh, sorry, we're going to have to add H plus, aren't we? Let's let that add. So we're going to have CH3. Oh no, we're going to lose, sorry. I am getting very confused today, aren't I? Let's just try that again, shall we? All right, to go from the acid to the base, you do have to lose your H+. So we're going to have CH3 and H2. CN minus, to go to the acid form, we're going to have to gain our H+. So this is going to give us HCN. To go to the base form from H2PO4 minus, we're going to lose a hydrogen ion. So we're going to get to 1H with PO4 and two minuses. Water, to go to its conjugate acid, we're going to need to add an H and add a positive charge. And hydrogen iodide, to go to its base, we're going to have to lose H+. Plus. So we're going to get to I minus. How did you go with those? Hopefully better than I did. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed today's video. I hope you enjoyed meeting some of the great scientists behind these theories and learning a little bit more about acids and bases. There is more to come, so look out for future videos. If you enjoyed the video or if you found it useful for your coursework, please consider giving the video a like. And of, as always, if you would like to learn more about this awesome subject of chemistry, then please subscribe to my channel and watch some other videos. I'm going to see you guys in the next video.